in that. So again, welcome everybody. It's the Abuja Literary Society, um, the ALS Book Jam. We're talking to Pehelo Mofokeng. Pehelo, please, the first thing you have to say is to let me know if I'm pronouncing your last name correctly. And Pehelo, first of all, it would be great if you could introduce yourself to us. Tell us a little bit about you. But then you are our guest for the Book Jam. And we waited for you a little bit. So you have to start from the very beginning, right? So which province in South Africa were you born in? What was going on around that time when you were born? Was it raining or was it sunny? Or you know, <laughs> information like that would be very useful. So start from the very beginning up until you. Now, one thing I'll say about you know, Pehelo is that Pehelo has been a big part of the Abuja Literary and Arts Festival. So all of the beautiful graphics, even when I you know take my video away, you can see some graphics there. That's you know from Pehelo as well. So he's sort of like someone that has a lot of different skills, right? So Pehelo, you're going to introduce yourself because, you know, I think you'll be best at that. So now over to you. I feel like you are abdicating your role as a... <laughs> Pehelo, I helped help you ground <laughs> for 30 minutes. So you have to introduce yourself. <laughs> Perhaps only because of that, I will do that. So I'm born in a in a, a slightly smaller but important uh, province in, free, in South Africa called the Free State. This is where you find 90% of the gold that goes from South Africa to the world, right? So I'm born in a small town called Castel. It's perhaps 20,000 households, including white people. Um, it's, a, it's a tiny town uh, in 1979. So I am 43 in, in a few months. Um, I am a publisher. I'm a magazine editor. I am a graphic designer. And part of what I do is Abuja Literary Festival, which I am Abuja Arts and Liter Literature Festival, which is one of my, if you wish, um, the hallmark of what I do, it's something that I hold so high in the air that I tell everyone that I do this, this big thing in Nigeria is being done by me, right? Uh, and I am a South African, and don't be xenophobic to Nigerians. You bloody South Africans, you know, um, because as Basoto, what Basoto means is Basoto or the brown ones. So people who are brown of their complexion. So what King Mushwesho, who is the founder of Basoto, uh, when people were asking for peace and incorporation into, into his people, he would ask if those people are brown, if they are Soto or Basoto, which we know as Basoto, right? And if those people were brown, you would be welcomed into his nation. That is how he became Basoto or Basoto. So, Basotho, among other Sotho-speaking nations in the Southern Africa, are the only people that have cliques. We are one of the few nations that can say kwa kwa or koboshiani or those kind of cliques, only because we accepted the Makosa, the Zulu, the San, the Nguni, the, you can name all of them, the Bushmen, and all those people that have cliques in their language. So we are not sort of or brown by virtue of being one simple small language group. We are basoto because we are brown. So King Mushwesho, even before he became king in the late 1700s, 1800s, he was already accepting other brown nations into his country. So I come from that big nation of brown people. Yeah, that's me. I hope I didn't waste anyone's time by explaining all of that. <laughs> no, of course not. I mean, but yeah, so you've started from the beginning. Now we want to get to know 
be hello the writer be hello the publisher publisher of books publisher of magazine you know so maybe take us through a journey about you know take us through the journey of how that came to be right so a friend of mine and i we had tried to get published in the late 20, 2000, 20 and I mean, I'm a good writer. I'm not a Malcolm Gladwell, but I'm not a terrible writer. And the big publishers were not having any of it, right? So we started thinking about how do we try and get ourselves out there in the public by way of uh, either a, a major publisher or by ourselves. So because we, we saw that uh, big publishers were not interested in independent people, they were interested in the big names, in big journalists, in big writers, in scholars and all of that, um, we started Gecko Publishing. And part of Gecko Publishing, we published our first book in 2007. Um, and after that, before that, perhaps from 2005, I had been publishing a magazine called BKO, which was a way of running away from Biko, B-I-K-O, which is Steve Biko, right? the uh, South African anti-apartheid um, matter, if you wish. And so we didn't want to say Biko, B-I-K-O, his surname, because you could get into all sorts of trouble, right? So we removed the I, and the magazine was known as B-K-O, right? Um, because we really we were trying to run away from getting into all sorts of um, naming rights and using someone's surname as the name for the magazine and all of that. So we started BKO and BKO was primarily a literature and arts and poetry magazine. So we've been running since 2004. I think we started in like April, March of 2004. And we stopped like maybe six editions later, which was a year and a half. And then I started again uh, last year because one of the things that I realized was that there wasn't a platform for writers to write about one, either what they are writing about, what they are talking about, politics of writing, even dynamics of writing, not alone the politics, but just the dynamics, you know, because Politics is one thing, but just the dynamics of writing. So for example, how do you get published? How do you get your book on TV and things like that? So I was, I was very much interested in that. So that is one of the reasons why we resuscitated the magazine. And I'm glad to announce that this year, uh, our first edition is on Ngugi Wationgo. Hmm. Well, so... BKO Publishing, and wait, there's BKO, which is a magazine, and then Gecko Publishing, which is a publishing house, right? Correct. Yeah, right? Yes. yes. So, but then even before then, how did you become a writer? Because you started the publishing houses to publish your book and your friend's book, but then how did you even start to write in the first place? Oh, no. Um, so I was forced because you know um, secondary school, I was forced into maths and science because I spoke a lot. Because I was one of those students that speak. But I mean, I, I was not interested in maths and science, right? I was more interested in history and the arts. So I was forced, I was sort of channeled into maths and science because I was a top performing student and all of that and da da. And I hated the stuff. Like I, I still hate science today. I hate maths today. So I was forced into maths and science. But in a nutshell, I'm even today I was listening to talks by Malcolm Gladwell from like 2004. 
So I'm a, I'm, I'm a historian, I'm, I'm a history person. So I would much rather write long, 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 long essays more than do two lines of mathematical equations and crap like that. Not because I can't, but because I don't find those interesting. I find history, story, storytelling, and narrative more interesting than, so for example, I find the story of Archimedes who came to Africa, to Egypt, and discovered the theory of trigonometry more than the story of, um, you know, the equation itself, right? So I'm more interested in human stories mm -hmm. more than in the technical elements of equations, electronics, technology, da, 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 da. but I'm more interested in people that discover technologies mm -hmm. and things that are life-changing as trigonometry and all of those. Mm -hmm. That's why even today, I was thinking to myself that when uh, the Greeks came to Africa, they found pyramids standing. This is like the pyramids were 2,000 years old when the first person who discovered the value of X over the square root of nine came mm. to Africa. We mm. had already discovered uh, trigonometry. Mm. And that is the only reason and how you get to build monumental things like the pyramids, right? Mm. That for me, as a story, as a narrative, of how we build pyramids is more important than the actual equation. And powerful, perhaps. And perhaps more powerful than actually the equation itself. So, so I've always, always been interested in stories. And my, I'm fortunate to have been raised by my father's grandmother, not my grandmother, mm -hmm. but my father's grandmother. Your great grandmother. Right? Great grandmother. Yeah. And Man, she would spun you a yarn. She would tell you stories on stories on stories for days. And she died in my arms. And I'm glad that, you know, I've got that kind of um, upbringing. Experience. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think I identify with some of what you say. Oh, well, I'll admit that for me in school, I was a science lover. I loved everything science and mathematics, but I also loved literature, right? But then I don't know, for yeah. some reason, our educational system here, I wasn't allowed to study literature in high school because I was a science student. I went to beg yeah. everybody, you know, they didn't let me. I think even when I got to university, I was also not allowed to take the literature elective and it was just always a struggle because I loved everything to do with literature. And something else you said about the publishing house is interesting to me because I heard recently that Sefiata, you know, one of the, the uh, is she Niger she's Nigerian, I guess, Nigerian origins. Well, I don't know if she's Nigerian American or Nigerian, whatever. Uh, that she's starting a publishing house that will just be publishing her books. <laughs> so that is interesting. Like she's starting a publishing house, but then not to publish other books, but just her books, at least for now. And, you know, similar to the story that you told, it's really about people trying to, or writers trying to take back, um, agency you know as far as their work goes and not so you know for example there are many great writers that were never published you know um while they were alive right so what if they had had the opportunity to start a publishing house and then get published and then it's not somebody somewhere that is determining whether you're able to actually witness um, your work getting out there and people enjoying whatever you've created. So that is very interesting. And I think there's a lot for us to unpack. I know, so before you joined Pehelo, we're talking to each other and asking ourselves, you know, um, what's, uh, I mean, how our weeks went and then just what we also we're looking forward to. A lot of people here are quite interested in publishing in general. And I think a lot of people are eager to, to learn more about publishing. But even before we start to talk about publishing, you just, um, published a new book right so you, you have a new book that is out and I think you're doing a little bit of um I don't know touring would I put it that way and um, speaking engagements trying to promote the book so can you tell us a little bit about the book you know so where the idea the name of the book 
where the idea for the book came from, how long it took you to write it? Because a lot of us here are like aspiring writers and we always want to know what other people's processes were, how they're able to keep themselves disciplined to start a book and actually finish it and then even get it published. And then how it's been so far since you published it and in, in trying to promote the book and even the reception. Yeah, we'd like to hear that. <coughs> I hope <laughs> you kill hell. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I nearly killed myself. Um, I apologize for that. Um, and I made a mistake. I should have had a glass of water. Yeah. Um, so firstly, the the book is called A Note to Daiwa. Daiwa is T-A-I-W-A. -A. Um, so Daiwa means the instructed one. So the one that gets the instructions. What, what it means in general is the one who gets ancestral instructions. So it's Taiwa, which is the instructed one. My interest personally as a writer is mainly on and in music. I, I like music. My father raised me on essential music. I mean, I was listening to Fela when I was like 12. I was listening to um, the Crusaders, to Oliva Mtukudzi, to um, all these people that do consider essential musicians when I was like really small, you know, because my father was so proud of me that, you know, here's a chap that actually made me a man. And I realized that about myself, that when I look at my firstborn, I'm like, excuse my French, but shit, this is the guy that made me a man, right? Uh, all along, I'm a boy, right? Um, so I've been doing that. I've been listening to like this very important kind of music that is liberating, that is history changing, that is so society changing. Um, so my interest personally, you, you asked me to talk about my book, my interest personally is so narrow that it is it is nearly almost all about my personal interest in music. So when I want to write about a book, a musician and all of that, I obsess about those artists. Like, like I obsess to the extent that it is nearly unhealthy. Like I obsess so much so that my brother would be pissed off about the music I'm listening. My children would be, oops, would be pissed off about the music I'm listening in the car. The only thing that I'm listening to when I'm working is this one particular artist, just to, you know, um, absorb and listen, and perhaps to listen beyond what I call listen beyond listening, right? So to listen to the extent that um, the listening is automatic. If, if I hear a note on radio, I can tell you this is so and so and so and so. If I hear uh, like a, a cling on the piano or the guitar, I can tell you this is so and so and so and so. And so much so that when I hear a piano riff by um, Donny Hathaway, I will tell you, this is the song, because I've listened to Donny Hathaway so many times, primarily because of his story as a musician. You know, he eventually um, almost killed himself, and, and oh, he killed himself, and uh, but it's a tragic, tragic, tragic story. And when you listen to his music, you understand why, right? Um, um, it's the kind of music that pulls your intestines out, right? When you listen to Fela Kuti, um, and I'm fortunate that I've been to Fela's shrine, um, you understand why Fela was so, um, not just alive, but alive with possibility, with, with politics, with just about everything, like, Right, so you 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 sort of understand. I mean, I went to Lesotho where my first book is is, is premised on um, this center 
this umbilical cord of my people, which is Basotho. And I saw all these places that Sankumata talks, writes, sings, and you know, narrativizes about in Lesotho. And I'm like, shit, this makes so much sense. If you look at the continent and you look at where Lesotho is, right at the bottom, you cannot help but think that Lesotho is the umbilical cord, right? Is is the is the belly button of the of the continent, right? And one of the the continent's most important musical countries or musical cultures come from Lesotho, right? Uh, at, well, at the very least, from my sort of experience and my listening. And I found that so important. So when you go to North of South Africa, you go to Limpopo and you go to Swaziland to, to, the, uh, to the sunset, um, you go to Zimbabwe, Mozambique, Botswana, Zimbabwe, Zambia, Namibia, Angola. You know, as you go around, you find this fast-paced music that is almost zydeco like right? And that music is so significantly different to all the music that comes out of South Africa, except for what you call the Limpopo Basin, right? So that's, that's my next interest is, why is the Limpopo Basin music so fundamentally different to what you find in South Africa? So you think Oliver Mtuguzi, but you think Thomas Mapfumo, you think everyone in Swaziland, and then you think Peter Tinet, Makadze right now, and all these people in Limpopo in South Africa, it's a completely different genre of music, right? So my interest is, can I tell the continental history from a musical point of view? If I could do that, I can tell you now, the history of this continent is not as depressing as what we've been told. It's, it's actually a glory, in many ways, very engaging history, but only purely from a musical point of view. So yeah, that's, that's, that's what makes a lot of interest for me. And why we started the company, we were rejected too many times. And we started the company, we started publishing other poets and all and so on. And we started staging poetry shows and literature festivals and, 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 and we've been going ever since. And I'm glad I met you and we you know, did the Abuja thing and I'm glad we could. <laughs> I hope we could do more and, 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 yeah. Yeah. Anyway, I'm going to put you on the spot here because I was like, I need to even reach out to Pihelu to commit you, you know, for our festival this year, right? You know, don't worry, we're going to have another discussion about that. But then... Um, no, but what is, why is that a spot? Because... I know now, I know you say you always... I'm there. Always with us, I understand. Yeah, it's no, I'm there. <laughs> It's not a sport. I'm, I'm there. Tell me what to do when, and, and I'm there. It's good to hear that's brilliant. And I mean, it's so interesting to hear how passionate you are about music, you know, because it's not always that you see people maybe in the literary space that are disconnected to other art forms. So, I mean, I guess that happens sometimes because music in a way, you have to write lyrics, you know, and things like that, which translates into things like writing prose or poetry. But then it's quite interesting how you sort of, I mean, everything that you were saying, I'm sure a lot of people were just looking at you like me, you know, we don't even, we're trying to understand, we're trying to follow, but it's like, wow, it's like someone, you know, the same way you said you don't like, um, a trigonometry in terms of the formula it was almost like you know looking at formulas somebody writing formulas on the on the wall and then trying to make sense of it but then it's, it's amazing it's fascinating i'm glad that you're doing this because these are some of the things that we don't have perhaps as a continent just really documenting you know some parts of our culture in a way that can make them um there for posterity right so and making sure that um we are participating in that documentation process. So it's not, um, say, other people from other contexts that are trying to 
um, reports on what we are doing, which is often the case as far as African historical culture goes or African music. You know, a lot of people that are telling those stories may not necessarily be African. I mean, that is fine, but then it's important for Africans to be playing a big part in that as well. So that is about your book. And now, so to everyone again in the room, don't forget, this is the Abuja Literary Society Book Jam. It's very interactive, right? So as you see me, I'm asking some questions. Oh, how come my place looks a little bit brighter? Is it an angel? <laughs> I think an angel is appearing to me. But um, if you have questions for Pihelo, based on what he said so far, please, you can raise your hand or you can type this in the chat. And if you have some specific questions that you'd like him to address as far as publishing goes, you can also type that in the chat or raise your hand, you know? So it's very interactive. You can actually, I, even as I ask questions, you can also take questions from the, from the audience when they come. So now, Pehelo, on this issue of publishing, um, so remember the last, was it last year or two years ago, when, I think it was last year, we wanted to do a panel um, at uh, Elite Fest, at the festival on publishing. Or, yeah, and it was about, um, I don't know how to put it now, but I think I think we call the panel a tale of African novels and their publishers, right? And it's the reality that, say, for a lot of the best performing African novels, for the big names or the biggest ones, it is uh, their Western publishers that publish them, and that is good because. You know, when you talk about trying to inject money into this space, right, in, inject book deals, inject funding, financing, it's often the Western publishers that can provide those kinds of book deals, you know, to African publishers. But then we realized that um, there, was, there was something wrong somewhere because, for example, I always mention the story that Weida Books, which is an African initiative um, by the organizers of the Ake Festival, Lola Shonaim. So what they used to do, I don't know if they still do it now, but then it's called One Read Africa. Uh, One Read Africa, I think. And it was a website where every month they would upload a book, right? That people could go and read from the website because the acknowledgement was that books are quite expensive here. So, I mean, the average book is very expensive. So, oh, One Read is now an app. It's good to know that. And, um, but many times when they would try to write to a, a writer to say, oh, we want your book to be the book um, that we're going to upload next month, you know, for people to go and read so that we can pay you. There were times when the publisher for that writer would say no. You know, they, I mean, it's not even, it wasn't even about money or anything. They just say no. They just refused to allow um, for that African writer's book to be part of that One Reads Africa project. And, you know, it, it was a little bit weird because you now have an African book by an African writer, but then not accessible to African audiences, right? So it was quite, quite strange. And I think that same problem, a lot of people are facing it because um, you, you try to publish your book sometimes with a Western publisher. And then when you now really want your book to be accessible here, because if your book is published in the US or in the UK, it's quite expensive to bring the fiscal copies here, right? It's very expensive. But then when you want to partner with a local publisher, sometimes you face challenges with your Western publisher where perhaps you did not read in the fine prints that you know they would not allow you do this or this or that. And then you now have writers trying to buy back the licenses, um, the publishing licenses for their book. I think there was one that made the news one or two years ago, one of the big, I don't know if she was from Zimbabwe, writers that she had to go and buy, um, she had to buy back the license um, for her book from her publisher and just the different ways around it. So I don't know if you could maybe comment on, you know, that publishing industry and some of the challenges there. You had an idea as well, if you remember, about something that we could do to improve things. So maybe you can mention that to us. And then after this, we're going to now go into the details of, say, some of the things that we said we we're going to discuss, which is what options are available to writers that are trying to get their work out there and trying to get published, whether through independent means or even on the, the, typical, the typical channels. Too much, or is that good? <laughs> I think this is that change. <laughs> so I'll, I'll, I'll tackle them one by one. I think the first one is that uh, what can, um, especially older, I don't know why younger writers are still publishing outside the continent, um, because it, there's no reason to. Um, at the very least in South Africa, if, if you publish a book with me, with my company and I say your book is out of print for whatever reason, 
uh, automatically the rights for those for that book returns to you, right? Um, so if I say the book is out of print for X, Y, Z reasons, uh, you automatically become the owner of that title, right? This is a very positive thing in terms of writing in at, at the very least in South Africa. So that 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 is the first thing. The second thing that you asked is, I've I've spoken to a number of clients who got published in the U.S. and the U.K. and so on and so on, and they don't have rights for their books anymore. And one of the most heartbreaking stories is, if you can imagine this. Um, and I still think it is the case, but um, Achebe's Things Fall Apart is not published in Nigeria, right? Um, so there's no Nigerian writer, I mean, publisher that can republish Things Fall Apart, right? So we don't own, as Africans, as Black Africans, we don't own the rights to Things Fall Apart. And this is one of the most canonical writings in the continent. It's the same thing with um, Chaka. I think Chaka, I would, be, I would only be able to publish Chaka by Thomas Mufolo from 2025, because it would be 100 years old. Because if memory serves, the copyright for public usage is 75 years in South Africa. So it might even be 2030, because if it's 70 years from the death of the public, of the writer, so it would be 2030. So things like that. So it is, it is a little absurd that once you are published by a company that is owned outside of a country, then your rights only stay for so long in that country and that country I mean, those rights, the, the, the length and period of time is a lifetime. I mean, 70 years is my child could be born today and they would only be able to publish a book that I published today in 70 years, right? So in 2092, they'd be able to publish my own book simply because that book was published by a publisher who's not South African, right? Um, so it's crazy. It's, it's, it's like complete madness. So once you are um, signed to this public publishing company, you are there for the next 70 years, right? And 70 years, I'm 43 this year, I would be 170 plus 43 is 113 when, when my child would be able to publish my book under his name, under his father's company's name, and, 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 and right? So it is important that we own publishing means. Now, these days, publishing does not even mean to go to print. It simply means to avail something online. So there is absolutely zero reason why we are not publishing more than we are. Because publishing could mean avail a book as a PDF, avail a book as a Mobi, as an EPUB, and so on and so on and so on. So you don't even have to go and print a book. And that's why I was so excited with Okada Books and Gecko and you know all these little companies that are mushrooming throughout the continent that are publishing African literature. You know, um, Reminga Mija in Namibia is publishing a uh, literature magazine. There's BKO in South Africa. There's something. There's there's um, um, uh, what is this uh, very popular one uh, by Nigerian writers? Um, There's publishing magazine. Mag Come on, remind me. Yeah, a, a journal, an online journal. Uh, oh, um, Brittle Paper. Brittle Paper, yeah. right? So, so we could do those kinds of things and we could, you know, sort of measure our efforts and say, can we have a bigger international, you know, big platform where we publish things about African literature by Africans, right? So much so that things like Abantu Book Festival in, in, in Soweto 
are important in the sense that this is a uniquely African continental literature festival owned, made, put together, produced by Africans, right? Um, um, uh, Chimamanda was there. Uh, I think uh, nearly every big publisher, I mean, big publisher, big author, big writer have been to Abantu Literature Festival in Soweto. And the, the, the importance of that is so that we can remove the ownership of our writing from people who are not us, right? Um, and this is why I'm excited and interested in being part of ALS or Abuja Literature and Arts Festival is because we are able to um, command, direct, produce African literature the way that we think it should be done. Right? Mm -hmm. This is important because it's not just about consumption, as we were saying, that if you are published elsewhere mm -hmm. in the UK, in the US, and you want to bring your, your books to South Africa or to Namibia or to Uganda and whatnot and whatnot, uh, it's difficult. So mm -hmm. in as much as America is able to produce people's books, Africa is. We are. We are able to, right? So even if the book is not owned, let's say, for example, Teniola Tayo wants to write a book about female scientists, female social scientists, and, 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 and. You don't find a publisher in, 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 in Nigeria, and you come to South Africa and I publish that, and then I give you rights for Nigeria. Mm -hmm. That is still much better than being owned by a New Zealand mm -hmm. or an American or a Mexican publisher. Absolutely, yeah. Right? yeah. So I think that is very important that all the material that we produce is owned here. Mm -hmm. uh, and that is important for a number of reasons that I can go on and on and on for another seminar or a talk. Yeah, no, you're very right. And I guess, and you also write that a lot of publishing houses are springing up, right? So even in Nigeria here, we have some new publishing houses that are coming up. And um, I mean, you started a publishing house, right? You know, can you tell us a little bit about what some of the challenges are and even so, for example, I know some people are looking to to submit to publishing houses. Can you hear me? Is, is my sound fine? Okay. Yeah, doing your face in a funny way. <laughs> I, no, I can't see. Struggling. So I, I squint oh, because can't I just can't see. Ah, uh, yeah. I see. Yeah. yeah. No, the, the, the lighting is a bit darker. So yeah, some people are looking to submit to publishing houses. I mean, they, they have the big ones and you know how difficult it is with the big ones. But for example, if someone wanted to submit or wanted to work with a, a publishing house like, like a Gecko Publishing, right? How does that really go? So first of all, the challenges that you faced so far, because maybe there are some people here that may be thinking about starting a publishing house at some point and just how it's been, you know, really. But then also, um, if someone wanted to work with, um, do we call them boutique publishing houses? Is that the right term? Independence, no, the, yeah, independence publishing houses. Yeah, how like does that really go? Yeah. <laughs> Excuse my French, but shit, man. Um, hey, I'm going to start charging um, you for your French, <laughs> <laughs> Okay, <I'm> sorry. <laughs> That's a very good way to get rid of the French crap. Um, um, so the first challenge is money, right? Um, and I suppose that's the biggest challenge for any kind of business. It's not just in publishing, but it's it's one of the biggest challenges for any business. Um, so it's money. Try and make sure that you have a bit of money to do the things that you want to do for the writers that you want to publish. Um, I think it's an advice to newer publishers. I would say try and partner with other people. I mean, I have this big dream, this big continental dream that I want to publish a book in South Africa, give the rights to a publisher in Nigeria, and they give um, secondary rights to a publisher in Equatorial Guinea 
and they can give the rights to someone in Togo, and they can give the rights to, you know, and all that would mean is, all we are doing is we are tracing the, the purchasing of this book throughout the continent, and then we pay each other from that, right? It doesn't even have to be a big endeavor. All it has to be is just good accounting. That's all it is, really. Like, if you really think about it, if I was to give you the rights to publish my book in Nigeria and you sell 50 copies by next week, all I want is 25% of that. That's all. And if you take those rights and you sell them to someone in, even if it's as close as Namibia, and they sell 100 copies, all I want is a percentage of that. That's all, right? So I think we have, we have, we have not done two things. One, we have not taken the advantage of technology and how technology allows us to transfer and move about um, ownership of rights. It, it can be a book, it can be music, it can be anything digital, right? We have not taken full advantage of digital ownership, digital publishing. We have not done that. So if we can do that as number one, then I think we can, as publishers, as music publishers, as music owners, and, and, and it becomes a different thing. So that's the first thing. The second thing, how do you start a publishing company? Please don't. This is a labor intensive, money intensive, and spiritually intensive endeavor. Uh, it's not something that I would wish on anyone. If my children ever take over Gecko, I would want them to take over Gecko because it is making money, but not because of my love for books, because right now there is zero money in books. Um, primarily because as an independent publisher, I don't have any way of telling the big uh, chain stores and the big trading houses to store my books. So in as much as my latest book, all the stock that I printed, I think it was close to 500 copies, it's all gone. I don't have that money, right? I Like I am not 200,000 rents richer, which is like, Three million naira. I'm not because it's ten thousand or or fifty thousand naira from publishing house one or book book store one or two or three or four. It's not there, right? So it's it's a very stressful kind of business, and I would want my children to be involved in something a lot more interesting, a lot more lucrative lucrative than in books. So I think if anyone wants to start a publishing company now, try and make sure that you have a very rich uncle, right? Number one. Number two, try and make sure that you have a very attentive audience. Other than that, if you try and do all of that purely because you want to make money, you're going to be frustrated. You're going to be... Um, all of those things. So the reason that I have started Gecko Publishing with my friend Andrew Miller uh, in 2004 was that we just wanted to get published, right? So if you are doing this for the reasons of posterity, the reasons of publishing material that will outlast you, right? Then go ahead. But if you are doing it purely so that you can make money, you might get surprised you mm -hmm. most likely you will get surprised. So I have not been, I've not, I've ever, I've never been bothered about the amount of copies that I've sold. I mean, I've spent close to 2 million Naira on my book, my latest book, and maybe I've made 500,000 so far, but I, I know 500,000 so far. So a quarter of what I spent on my book uh, has come back to me. But I know that when the book gets the right kind of attention, whenever it does, I would never have to work again. Yeah. You know, 
Mm. So it's 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 dicey, man. It's it's um. Mm. But also the the one question that I always keep saying to people is that if we don't do it, who's going to? Mm. Right. Mm. So it's going to be this thing of "Inda by My Children" by Credo Mutua, one of the most canonical books ever, ever in the writing history of Africa. It's not owned in South Africa, right? So I, I wanted to republish that book, but I can't because it's not published here. So you find that you, you get a, um, a things fall apart that is owned by Penguin. When are we going to publish things fall apart in Pigeon, in Sesotho, in Zulu, in Yoruba, in Igbo? We are not going to do it until and unless we own that title. And we're not going to own it because it's owned elsewhere. So it's very important that, you know, you've got Okara books, you've got whatever Chimamanda is doing in the continent, you've got whatever um, Zuki Sawana is doing in Kenya, you've got Gekko, you've got um, whatever uh, Ngamija is doing in Namibia and all. So it, it might be small, small, small things where we are making like $2,000 a year. You know, it looks like, we are wasting our time, but at the very least, we own these narratives for the next yeah. hundred years. You know, yeah. when our children are ready, they will publish those things for like hundred millions of dollars for movies. You mm. know, mm. so we, we are not wasting our time. You know. Mm. Yeah, and and I'm sorry, I spoke too long. I'm sorry. I, I no, okay, it's fine. But then this is something that I think sometimes we forget because when we see other contexts with like maybe very mature and advanced publishing industries that have a lot of money. We don't see um, the journey, like where they started from and people that, you know, put in their life savings in one small publishing house some 200 years ago, 300 years ago, how they just tried to, you know, how it was, it was first of all, usually passion and just um, conviction that something was important to do, you know, even before um, the reward started going. So sort of like the early movers in particular industries, in particular context, right? And just the sacrifices that they often have to make because it's wherever they get to that others can now come and build on. So I, I think that people have to realize that even more. But then something that you said was interesting. So is it true that there is no Igbo ver version of Things Fall Apart? Um, I think Ese will know the answer. I do not know. <laughs> No, no, no. I'm, I, I, I'm unsure. Yeah. I'm unsure. But if you remember, there was a very important um, conference in, in 1962 in Makerere um, University, where, for example, um, it was led by Chinua Achebe of Nigeria. It was led by uh, Eski and Pachel of South Africa. In attendance was Ngugi Wationgo. Langston Hughes mm. uh, and other very prominent writers. In that conference, we call it the crime of the century, uh, a friend of mine and I, and Achebe, among other people, and Mpasele, they were leading the charge that said, if it is not written in English, it is not literature, right? So, um, Everything that precedes them, even by like 50 years, by 70, 80 years, for example, work that is written in 25 by Thomas Mufolo in Sesotho, um, to Duola in like 1930, um, and so on, for them, it was not literature. Now, there are two, there are two kinds of schools of discussion. The first one is that we have killed or we have allowed African languages, writing, literature to die in the continent, right? Or we have made it so insignificant that when you write in Sesotho, in Igbo, in Yoruba, in Chichewa, in Swati, and, 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 and in the main, your book will be relegated to high school writing. So you've written for pupils, for learners in high school, right? Yeah. I hate, 
I hate that way of thinking because it's always about the big publishers trying to maximize what they think is this erotic, big, exotic language that does not necessarily form part of literature. Mm. Right? So if you think of one of the most important books in the continent, it is Thomas Mofulos Chaka that is published in English in 1930, but it is formatively written in Sesotho in 1925, or it is published in 1925, mm. only in Sesotho, right? So what makes it big is the fact that someone takes it and they, they translate it into English, right? So for me, it is not only important that we write in our languages, that, that, that is besides the point. You should be writing in your own language, right? But to glorify English writing as if it is this godly writing is so problematic. It is so mysterious. Yeah, right? but you know, Pehelo, this language dominance is, um, I mean, we all know it comes from colonialism and things like that. And it's a problem that plagues many people. So I know even for a lot of, uh, even European books to some extent, right? It's really when they got published in English that their popularity, I, I guess because it's literally because the English went around the world conquering populations and then making people speak English. So when something is in English, a lot more people can access it versus you know the other way around. But I really like how, for example, for some of these even European books that I'm mentioning, but they did publish them in the original languages. But the value of the literature, and which is the case of, of the book that you just mentioned, the one that was first of all published in Sesotho in, in, in uh, 1925, you said, you know, so that recognition, so it shouldn't be the, the other way around where um, you start in a language and then it's not even difficult for you to bring it to your own language. You know, the, the, the reverse should be the case where you can publish in your language if you choose to, and then the outside world can make the efforts to access what you're saying by, you know, translating your words from whatever language into their own language, whether it's English or French or Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa. So yeah, I, I think that it's a very, very important point. And now we're gonna segue it into sort of like the practical side of things, right? And again, I'm telling everyone in the room, please, if you have questions, ask your questions, or if not, we'll just be talking and talking and talking, right? So really, you know, when it comes to publishing and especially for, for new writers and for maybe, uh, do you, call, do you say independent writers? I don't, I don't think there's anything like that. But then for new writers that are trying to um, put their first book out there, whether it's a collection of short stories or whether it's a novel or just anything, you know, what is what, what does it look like? So what does it look like for them to reach out to someone like Gecko like Gecko Publishing? You know, how does that really work? How do you go about selecting um, the manuscripts that you publish? What is the process for that? Um, how do you sort of like hold the author's hands in the entire process, let's say from the beginning to the end? Just what does that look like? I want to see into, into that structure, that publishing thing. So I want to check under the engine and understand the way it works. So it's hard. I'll tell you that. Not much. Uh, it's hard. Um, so I want to respond to this, but I also want to respond to a previous point that um, perhaps I am wrong in thinking that uh, we should do... I didn't say you were wrong, though. Well, I didn't say you were wrong. <laughs> but, 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 but very quickly, no, no, no. I know I took too long to answer that question, but very quickly. I think that we should... I suppose my point was this, that we should not be afraid of writing in a particular language because it would not be received globally um, by people because we did not write in language X. I suppose that's my point. So if you write your story in Yoruba, in Igbo, in English, in Hausa, in Sesotho and so on and so on, that should not matter. What, what should matter is, are you able to tell your story as best, as optimally as possible? That's all. 
you know, it is up to the publisher to then take that story and sell it to the Italians, to the Germans, to the English, and and, 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 and make money for you, right? So that, that is the duty of the publisher, right? So I think that is important more than, um, are you a good English writer? That shouldn't matter. What should matter is, are you a good storyteller in any language? So if I'm a good storyteller in my language, in Sesotho or in Isizulu, and so on and so on, that's all that should matter. The publisher must be able to sell that story in whatever, and by language, I don't only mean technical language, but I also mean uh, in film. Film is a different language to actual book writing, in plays, in, in podcasts, in all sorts of, and all manner of things. That is the duty of the publisher. It's not your duty as a writer. Your duty as a writer is to tell a story. And if you can tell a story in a particular language, that's all. Like, like that's it. You know, if you can tell, tell a compelling and moving and powerful story in any language on the continent, my dream is we should have a hub of stories, of literature, of science, of archaeology, of all these things, one big hub where we can find all these things in one place or a couple of you know, places. But I want to go to one place. I can find African music mm. of Chichewa, mm. of, of Sesotho, of mm. Ibo, of Yoruba, of Tigray, and, and, and under one roof right mm. and it is all locally owned so mm. how do you submit stuff to gecko we've got two platforms the first one is our, our website you send me an email we read we talk and we publish but another platform is our magazine bko which continues bko magazine.co.za and interestingly enough for the month of May, we are focusing on the importance of Ngujiwa Tiongo, right? Mm. As one of the spearheads of writing in African languages, any African language. And it is very funny that people think that African languages are not valuable. I don't understand the argument. Like, <laughs> <laughs> Like out of a billion people or two close to two billion people in the continent, only half of us speak English. Mm. The rest of us speak native, whatever native is. So why are we not writing in those languages? So I find Nguiwa Tiongo's writing, Nguiwa Tiongo's um, push and motive for uh, writing in, 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 in our languages so interesting right? mm -hmm. so this year i mean this month we are we are focusing on ngugi's um legacy and we are looking for articles poems um, opinion pieces and so on and so on but the point is people don't have to stress themselves about writing in english you can write in any language i will find a translator for that language. Mm. And that's how in many ways we get published is, um, and I know that a lot of us miss this. If you want to get published, please understand, try and find out what that publisher is looking for. The reason that I reject a lot of potential books, stories, articles, and all of that is that when you read what the people are writing about, they have nothing to do with what you are looking for. And that's the main reason. It's, it's can you read the guidelines? What am I looking for? You know, there are times when I'm not looking for poetry at all. Like I'm not interested as a publisher in poetry at all. I'm looking for short stories, novels, long form, short form, da 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 da. But I'm not, and then you get 100 entries and 100 submissions of poetry. 
You like? <laughs> it's it's simple things like that. Can you just take ten minutes, read what we are looking for as a publisher, take that seriously, and submit. Sometimes it is as simple as that. You know. Hmm. Hmm. So people send you manuscripts and then you read the manuscripts and then you decide whether to publish. So aside this thing that you just mentioned about people not following the guidelines in terms of what you're looking for, what about what other big mistakes would you say writers make when they submit to publishers? Sometimes writers don't like to be edited. Uh, this is the biggest thing, like especially in, in, in South African uh, or Southern African writing, people hate to be edited, right? And listen, um, we have a very funny social media. Uh, uh, English is not your mother. Instead of English is not your mother tongue, right? But we say English is not your mother. That is to say that sometimes you write such bad English that you start insulting us. Leave alone the message, right? Um, but now your your bad English borders on insults, right? This is important because if you are going to use a language, I try when I can to write to talk to. I work for a global company, and part of what I try and do, or part of my friends, are like Nigerian, Tanzanian. Kenyan, uh, and I would try and write in pidgin, right, for mm. my Nigerian friends. Mm. And I would actually double check that with other people on my WhatsApp, and and I would say, how far means how are you? Yeah, yes. And they say yeah, and then I would send that through because if I get that wrong, I could be insulting my five levels executive. Senior <laughs> in the company, right? Because yeah. if I get yeah. the pigeon wrong, yeah, I messed up, right? So, yeah. I, I could actually lose my job, hmm. right? So, <laughs> so language is extremely important. Hmm. It's, it's not something to trifle with. It's it's like really, really, really important. Hmm. So if you want to write in English, you better have good command of English, right? So mm -hmm. the first thing that I get when people submit stuff is that in many cases, and, and I, it can only go one of two ways. It's either you get one extremely good story written badly, or you get extremely well-written but bad story, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's one of two things. Mm -hmm. So, so I, could, I could write a terrible story but I use all my English. I use everything that I can to tell the story well. And then when you read in between the lines, you're like, but it's not is such a terrible thing. <laughs> yeah. The alternative is that you get this badly written English. And then when you read in between the lines, you're like, but this is such a fantastic story, mm. right? So in some cases, what I've done is I've taken terribly written but extremely good stories mm. and made them into books in other cases you found these people who can hardly write mm. but the story is amazing and vice versa the story is nowhere but they are such incredible writers mm. so what you do in that case if, if for example i find you teddy tayo and you are a terrible story writer Mm. but you are from Nigeria and I'm getting a lot of Nigerian requests, yeah. I would say, read this for me. And I pay you for that. And you start, you know, because terrible writers are often very good editors. Mm. Yeah. Like, mm. like, I see. like, I don't think I'm an extremely good writer, but I'm a, I'm a terribly good writer. I'm an editor. Like mm. I would, I would edit the crap out of, a story. Mm. I would I would make that story so compelling that a I mean I used to write for TV. So um 
I would make a story so viable that a TV film studio would want to buy it, right? Mm -hmm. so, so while I may not be an extremely good writer, originator of things, mm -hmm. as an editor, I, I, I you know take my head off for myself. Powerful. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So, so it's, it's, it's a combination of those two things that sometimes you are a terrible writer, but you're an incredible editor. Sometimes you are a terrible writer in a language, but you're an incredible writer in another. Mm. And I think that we need to keep challenging ourselves because that's another thing that people think that in order to be a novelist, to be a fiction writer, and you have to be an English French writer. No, you can actually tell that same story in your in your national language and you yeah. might just be you know our next Ngugi yeah hmm. so i have a question just now yeah so generally would you advise people like if they have a manuscript right on hand that they're finished with would you advise them to approach independence publishers as is that a good way to to get their work out there so i would say two things i would say firstly um as a writer, think about where you want to see yourself, right? Yeah. The, the, like that, that's so extremely important. Um, a lot of the old writers do not have rights to their work now because that right, those rights are owned outside of the continent, right? Mm -hmm. the, there are very few writers, old writers today who can say they can republish their work that was published in the UK in 1942, 52, 62, 72, 82, right? So one of the reasons why I would encourage you to approach an African independent publisher is so that 50 years from now, your work is owned continentally, right? Mm -hmm. So I can approach Okada books, I can approach I can approach Zuki Swawana, I can approach Reminga Mije, all continentally, often we meet in festivals in the continent, I can say, I wanna publish this thing by Teni Tayo in Sosoto. They would say yes, or they would say, you know, whatever. But I cannot do that if that book is owned by a big publisher, <laughs> Yeah. X. No, 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 let's not mention people's names. Because <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in the industry. That's why I'm not hesitating. Yeah, yeah, I get that. Yeah. Yeah. So I so I think I think it is very important that we in we, we approach independent publishers so that our work remains in the continent. Mm -hmm. The other um problem is that a lot of people think that when you publish yourself but through a third party publisher it means they own their work they don't so i've got a number of friends who published a book in the uk and now they must pay the uk publisher four thousand uh, euro or four thousand pounds to get the rights for their books mm. in many cases many of us in the continent would not do that so if I publish your book and then we get to the end of uh, the feasibility right. of that book in five years or uh, feasibility of print, I will simply relinquish the rights to you, right? Um, so it's very, again, it's very important that you approach a local publisher so that they can publish your book. Okay. Um, but the other reason is that so that we have rights for other rights, we have rights for Dudu Busani Dube uh, did that with, uh, she published herself, but now her book is a television series. Hmm. This is historical. This is, this is like <laughs> one of those crazy moments in South African history. Like a black woman under her 40s has got her book on TV. Hmm. Like, do you understand how mind blowing this is? Hmm. It's, it's, it's crazy. Like it's, you go to show Mags, First thing at 5.30, 6.30 or 7 o'clock is this thing called The Wife. It's published by a person your age, my age. Mm. Right? Mm. And, and she published it herself. It's mm. not owned by some European big 
five publishing cup. No, no, mm. no. This is a black woman being effing successful by herself. She published this thing herself. <laughs> you know, this is this is history breaking, dude. It's not history <laughs> making. It's breaking. It breaks history. It's it's amazing. And I am so bloody proud of her that you know she hung on to that manuscript. She's like, I don't care who says what, I have so much belief in this thing that it is going to make it. And we can make it. Like we can. So I think in many ways, let us. I know it's it's all glory and you know uh, Ubuntu and you know <laughs> uh, what is the word uh, Pan Africanist and all of but can we try and keep our work here at least try you know yeah. and some of these results are not immediate but I mean it's so important that if you and I could republish things fall apart now. Mm. How amazing would that be? Imagine things fall apart in SMS language. Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Interesting. SMS language. Hmm. But hello, there's one other issue that I want us to touch on. So remember we're talking about um, Amazon publishing rights as... Yes. <laughs> as an option that some people try to explore when it comes to publishing their books. So, yes. you know, Amazon has this, I mean, I don't even know a lot about it. You were the, the, you were the one I heard about, about, you were the one I heard about it from for the first, <laughs> well, I heard about it from you for the first time. And um, I guess it's a service for writers, you know, um, because Amazon does all of the publishing for you. You just have to maybe upload i don't know i have no idea how it works but then if you can just tell us a little bit about that and a little bit about why you may have some reservations about it and you know to what extent is it really an option that um some african writers can explore as far as getting their books out there goes yeah so amazon is interesting and this interesting at the same time so Amazon is like uh, the TV writing kind of thing. So you need to get the formula and get the formula right, right? So if you have something like African, you know, fringe South African music history as a book, you, you are not going to sell two copies. I mean, I published my first book in 20... 15, 2016. I don't have a check from Amazon, right? That's the first thing. The second thing is that you will have to, you will have to, you will have to sell uh, X amount of copies because before you can get a check from Amazon. Um, so. I suppose that's the second problem. The second problem is that I had not done enough marketing, sales, and all of that to sell enough copies on Amazon, right? But the third thing is that I think I had not done enough to meet the requirements of Amazon, um, which is in the main, what does Amazon sell, right? Perhaps that's the better question to ask. Amazon sells what American and European writer, I mean, readers want, right? So if you are going to write about Africa, you have to write this poverty porn, right? Which is um, Ethiopian child sold into slavery mm. or on the brink of famine or Nigerian sold into prostitution or South African, it's crime, and you know, like there is a forbid, right? Mm. So that's the first thing. The second thing is, I have friends who are white females, female writers, white, female, mm. slightly older than me, so maybe 45, 
between 45 and 50 who are writing this teen fiction for white Americans, white American kids, mm -hmm. white American teenagers. And they are selling like crazy on Amazon. Mm -hmm. They are selling like a thousand impressions a day, not a month, because they can write what their children are feeling in South Africa uh, right now um, from, you know, stranger danger, black men mm. wanting to have sex with you because you are white, young, fine looking mm. thing, kind of danger to um, crime, to all the stereotypical nonsense about um, white people versus black people in South Africa and elsewhere, right? Mm. So they can write that crap. But you and I, if we want to write, say for example, the, the important essence of the failure or successes of President Goodla Jonathan <laughs> or of President Cyril Ramaphosa today, and we want to fictionalize that, you and I will sell 10 copies combined in two years, right? So I think people that want to go to Amazon you have to find what the recipe is. Mm. And there is a recipe. Like mm. there is, there is one. There is uh, yeah. right, uh, two chapters that start like this, that mm. do this and this and this. Uh, it's the same thing that you find when you try and write a script that will be accepted by an American uh, film production yeah. house and so on and so on. So find what that, you know, um, yeah, structure is markets, yeah. yeah, yeah. Find what that structure is and stick to it, and you will sell like crazy on Amazon. I write things that are so left of center that <laughs> I think people have forgotten that I've written two books, you know, uh, and I'm I'm not writing them so that I can sell tons and tons of millions of copies, but I write them mainly for posterity and the fact that I like history and 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 and, and. so I think. Uh, there's a difference between why we write uh, things and if you are going to write for Amazon I mean I'll, I'll find links and I can share them with you mm -hmm. but you have to write in a particular formula and you will sell a ton a ton of books and and as a matter of fact you can use a white woman's um, pseudonym you can call yourself Susan ah, yeah so you're hacking the system yeah. No, you, you can. You yeah. absolutely can. You can call yourself Susan God knows what. Mm -hmm. And Collins. you write this. Collins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And you, you write this crazy but extremely um in demand kind of work. You you you, you absolutely can do that. Mm. You know, but if you're going to write in your name the way that I do, um, you know no one is going to buy it yeah hmm. that's that's um that's an interesting thing to reflect on so the way i see it i guess it's the idea of capitalism right and how the amazonification of publishing is introducing even in a different dimension capitalism to the publishing industry because that was already existing for the for a lot of the western publishers but now in this case with amazon which is more like fast um, fast consumption right the same way it is for all of their other products it now has to be you're now playing you now have to play to people's taste per time and so rather than maybe sticking to authenticity or genuineness or like trying to tell real stories, you just have to figure out what are people reading, you know, today? What are they trying, what are they looking for? What kinds of names of authors, you know, would they be looking to read from? And then you now try to hack the system. So it's interesting. I almost see it as... Um, I mean, I almost see a possibility where, and this has happened before, right? Because I think one of my, a writer that I really like, she used to write poetry, um, almost like Maya Angelou, but then her name is, um, her name is, I mean, her name is not coming to me now. Yeah, no, Wanda, yeah, Wanda Coleman, something like that. And when she used to write her poetry, I mean, she used to write books of poetry, but then she was also moonlighting as a writer in, was this? 
I don't know how to, like a sex magazine, an erotic magazine. So she was writing erotic stories, right? So that was where, I don't know if I've gotten the story right now, but then that was how she was making money at that time, even though she was writing her books of poetry that eventually got published and she became very popular. But then, you know, Moonlighting, using, you know, using her specific skills to play the market in terms of, okay, at that time, people were reading a lot of erotic stories. So I almost see a situation where uh, maybe some African, uh, because this is happening with the NFT space where people are not necessarily creating arts that they want to create at the moment. I mean, for some people, they're creating arts that they feel people will buy, you know, as NFTs, because there's an idea of what an NFT piece of art looks like. So they are trying to game that system. So I see a situation where uh, if, let's say more African authors decided to try the Amazon model, then it will be more of them having that as a separate um, stream of, of work or stream of, of, of output for themselves. So almost like writing a comic book or writing like fan fiction and, you know, those kinds of things, you know, that these are throwaway things that you just put out there to raise yourself some money. So what I want to do now, I want to put some people on the spot because there is no way that for this whole uh, meeting, um, it's just going to be my voice and Pihelo's voice. So Ese, Gerard, you're going to be number one to just at least say something, comment on what you've maybe heard so far, even if you don't have a question. And after Ese, Mr. Cabra Zakama, because you are, a, you are a regular, so you're going to be number two, you know, to just contribute to the discussion, you know, share some of your thoughts or, um, I don't know, agreements, disagreements, and starting with you, Ese. Well, I hope Ese has not disappeared. Okay, Ese, you're still here. I'm here. <laughs> Yeah, but I come from my video. So I God. think I like. I also the... wanted to hear from Chika. I'm sorry, Ese. I'm sorry. I'm sorry, okay. my sister. Um, then you robbed me. I wanted to hear from Chika as well. From I'm who? sorry. I'm sorry, Ese. Go on. Go on. Go on. Go on. Okay. <laughs> so I, I, I wanted, I want to, I wanted to force Tenny to ask Chike to say something as well. Mean something. DK. DK, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. I'd love to hear from you. I'd yeah. I'd love to hear from you. It's over to you. Okay, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Yes. Oh, okay. So I think um, I think I've enjoyed it thus far. I actually tweeted the part that made me laugh when he spoke about um um, you find that uh, what's it called? You find that poor writers, right, make very good editor. I actually think at least for now I fall under that umbrella because I try to write something. I'm like, what am I writing? But I know how to edit people's story very well. And that thing you had suggested, Tony, about how with NFTs, that's I'm um, someone interested in arts, but in the digital art space, I see it a lot. Like you can put ten digital artists, and you can almost see the formula that they use and then if they you try to read maybe would i say the backstory everyone is always, there's always still that hint of what i will call poverty porn and i think i liked the suggestion he gave about if you're going to um yes i think we lost you i see there for example the amazon Hello? Is Ae there? Mm, I think you managed to Okay. Okay, we can hear you now. Oh, okay. So yeah, I said that those were, I think the main things that I picked for me, the way if you have to go the Amazon route, yeah. take that formula. I have noticed people in my circle who take that Amazon route. It's mm -hmm. always about what I like to call aspire to perspire books. Mm -hmm. Like maybe, um, five tips to break it into it's never like their true love's passion you yeah. know you read some books and you know okay this was a labor of love mm -hmm. for most people it's not that and the thing he said about that ghostwriting term I actually know many people doing that in Amazon so you see a Nigerian um, writing something let me use for example oh how to do copy content strategy for a big organization and you know they'll be dropping brands i was reading one one day and i was laughing i said these people don't even have business in nigeria so maybe not to be critical but i did like his tip i do think a question i might have for him was about when he, he was talking like with the work he's doing with ungogi 
And when he even gave the example of with Achebe, which I was very shocked, I didn't know this um, decades ban thing. I wonder though that, you know, when people, I hear some people talk about, oh, I'm, I'm playing in the publishing space. I'm trying to give more voices to African writers. I now have to ask him, even him is leaning on a recognized well-known brand that we can talk today is because he's gotten, like I say, it's gotten popular and we've gotten the um, English versions of his book and now the foreign versions. But it's worth asking about him. You can't come and say, oh, I want more people to write in their languages. I want more yoga people to do this and that. But even you that have a publishing house, can you see how it's very easy for you to lean on the popular names you already know? You're telling me of your music source and you're mentioning Fela. I'm just giving, I'm, I'm not being critical. I'm just saying we should hold these mirrors to ourselves. I tell me, oh, you went to the shrine and you had this experience. Oh, well, I'm good. But you can see how if you're talking to someone who is trying to bust into that space, they might see him and say, I beg this one, you've done your own. So it's, I think it's something maybe he should watch for, even as he tries to talk or connect with people. Someone listening might not feel, feel it. But I really, I'm going to do more research about that band thing. Maybe I'll use it to form Social Justice Warrior. But it's very interesting to know. But yeah, I have loved today's meeting. So thank you. Sorry, I know I've taken so long, but thanks. No, thank you, Ese. I'll give um Pehelo, Pehelo just like one minute to respond to Ese so that we can hear from maybe one or two other people. No, I I I love Ese's everything, whatever she says. I like um she's smarter than I am. And I think I think uh black women, African women should run publishing history society and presidency of the continent because we are just messed up as African men. Um, I think she's right. Um, and even though she says she's not criticizing, I don't mind criticism as long as it's not um, criticism for the sake of it, but she's criticizing and she crit she's criticizing me properly that as much as I want to glorify Ngugi, uh, Achebe, and all these people, those people, I've only ever read them in English, right? I've, I've never read Ngugi Kikuyu, for example, which is his language. But that is the point that I would rather really have Ngugi's uh, original language and grapple with that, read them in Kikuyu and go read them in English. That for me forms a way of Africanization. It is the same thing as when people read or people read Marx in German, then they read in English or English then in German. Hegel and, and all the other, the other um, canonical writers. Mm -hmm. I don't see why this would be difficult for Africans to do. Mm -hmm. if, if Ngugi, for example, is written in Kikuyu and Swahili, mm -hmm. I could take that Swahili and bring it south. Whereas you in Nigeria could take that Sahid and take it north, right? Mm. But we are reading the same text. And in, most likely we would have a lingua franca in 20 years because we are reading the same text in one language. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't see it as a big problem. Mm. I think I see English as a way out, as mm. a very easy way out instead of learning about each other in between yeah. Cultures, you know, yeah. uh, I can go on and on and on about yeah. this. And, yeah, yeah. I want but, to see. but I think I think Essay should be our president. I agree. You know, Essay is, is I don't know if she has finished it now, but then she's about to be a doctor, a PhD. So you're actually no, no, she sounds like absolutely. <laughs> yes, like but, a so absolutely. um, Kabura yeah. Zakama, are you there? So and... Please, please ask for my. For my pardon from her, I think she's. Oh, okay. um, I got in in the middle of what she was saying, and she was. Yeah. yeah. Mr. Cabra, and while me, before Mr. Cabra speaks, I want to say that we can we'll take one last person, and if someone wants to volunteer, you know, to to be the last person to speak, then you can raise your hand. So Cabra Zakama, it'll be good to hear from you. I can see you already. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think the pop, the publishing uh, in in Africa. Um, is very difficult, the, the climate, and particularly given the economic situation now. So not only is it difficult 
and expensive to publish, it is also very difficult for people to buy books when the cost of books can fit them for a couple of days. So I think um, the key is in our hands as writers. I keep emphasizing the importance of collectives. We need to come together. ALS need to start thinking of how to support her members to publish, but authors need to come together. We have a lot of examples of that and even cross country, like Jalada, Jalada Collective, for instance, where you have Nigerians, Kenyans, and other people coming together to publish each other's book. Maybe one book today, I mean, um, this year or, or, or in the next six months, another author in the group is published. And even in when you come to Amazon publishing, uh, a lot of people form groups where they support each other because the critical thing is the marketing because I'm sure you wouldn't want to write. I mean, we are moving away from writing for people. So we want to write what we want to write, not because we want to feed some American or some other people's appetite. So we need to come together and support one another. There are so many groups like that who help each other with book design, um, the launch, the marketing, and so on and so forth. I have, um, I have a books in boots program where authors collect each other's books because most of what we are seeing now is self-publishing. Self People pay for printers to print their books and dump it with them. So no marketing. So we need to support one another. That's what I'm trying to say is the collective. It's coming together because we are in the same situation yeah. and we have to help one another. Yeah. Over. Yeah. Thank you so much for that. And I think that that is even a good, I mean, I, I since no one volunteered or raised their hand, I think that it will be a good note to end this session on, right? So we do have a lot of problems and a lot of challenges, but then it's about coming together and, you know, investing our resources and our energy, similar to what Spihelo is doing, in laying some of the groundwork that means that those that come after us may have a bit of an easier time. So Pehelo, we are out of time. I don't know if you want to say something final for 30 seconds. 30 seconds. <laughs> 30 no, seconds. I think people can go. I think I think Mr. Zakama is absolutely on the money. Um, it's it's the only way we are ever going to make a difference here continentally, individually. It's ever only if we are yeah. together. So yeah. uh, that's why I appreciate what you are doing as ALS, what we are doing here as Abantu Festival, as mm. French Hook, as all these things. Yeah. We can ever only do that if we are together. And yeah. I think yeah. he's spot on, he's right on the money. And one of the things that we have not done as Indies mm. is that we have not uh, leveraged on tech, on on coming tech. together and all yeah. of that and collaboration mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. Yeah. absolutely thank you so much thank you so much for joining us today despite um some of the technological challenges and i apologize for that I really no, that's, that's what I, we understand. Uh, no, we understand very well because you know we've moved our programming online for two years now, so we know so what some of the challenges are. And thank you to everyone that joined. You know, um, this is and the answer for president Society. of Africa. Yes, yeah, so this is the Abuja Literary Society. We meet five Fridays every month. Four Fridays, four Fridays every month. We have two open mics at Transcorp Hilton, and then a book club at um. A cafe in Meitama, the name skips my mind at the moment. So this session is going to be uploaded on, on, on YouTube. So you can go back to it, maybe to, to you know, to, to recap some of Pehelo's words. And I, I mean, thank you to everyone for joining. Uh, we hope you join us again next time, which is going to be next month, last Friday of the month for the book jam, if you're not based in Abuja. And thank you, Pehelo, uh, as well. And yeah, have a lovely a lovely uh, sorry Friday and also a lovely holiday weekend ahead. We have a long holiday coming up. I don't know how in South Africa you don't have it, shall I? I don't think so. You just have one day, isn't it? Monday, Labor Day. Yeah, we only have Monday, yeah. yeah, yeah. But I'm on leave and Tuesday I'm going back on Wednesday. So I'm, okay. I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, everybody, and uh good night. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye.
have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Take care.